Hi, my name is Chase. Very excited about what I've prepared for you, specifically what we consider to be the greatest uh, transportation innovation of the last 100 years. And for me, on a more personal note, because I'm also a young person that's deciding what is worth my life's work, uh, I consider it to be the greatest modern narrative of change through innovation of all. And that's why I'm on this path. But that's enough about me. Uh, today I bring you the case for micromobility in the most clear, concise, and data-driven way I can manage. So I could give you all sorts of breakdowns of miles and horse, just gave you a little bit of that, but the big idea is that 16 trillion miles are taken by the car globally every year. And much of this is in the US where we've actually built our cities around the car. And then the next idea is that the car uh, was a bundling of trips. We have to think of measuring miles, or, or not necessarily vehicles, because I do not purchase a car, I purchase the ability to get somewhere. Uh, we do not buy tools, we buy outcomes. For example, I do not buy a drill, I buy a hole in my wall. And the invention of the car was that it sold you freedom. It, it took every trip that you want to take from the short to the long, from the errand for eggs all the way to the cross-country road trip and sold it to you as a bundle. And the reason why our solution is so compelling is because most trips are small trips. In fact, the most recent data from the U.S. Department of Transportation shows that 50%, half of all trips, are under only three miles. Half of them under three miles. And actually, 80% are under 10 miles. And you, you look at the rest of the world, and the distance will be even shorter because, again, in the U.S. in particular, we've built our cities for the car and not for the human. And here on the right side, you can see these white bars representing the difference between micromobility and what we call automobility. And at, at the bottom, that dashed line the, it represents the passenger and their bags at 100 kilograms. And how does it make sense to move them? Is it a 20 kilogram vehicle with a 90% efficient electric powertrain? Or is it a 2,000 kilogram vehicle with a 30% efficient internal combustion powertrain? This would be to push 17 times more weight, three times less efficiently. And of course, now we have to talk about Tesla and you know, maybe you get a two to three times more efficient, um, more efficiency with Tesla. But the problem here is that we think that two, a 2x improvement is going to make more of a difference than it will. What we need is a 200x improvement. It's basic physics. And above this, we see another line, which is where we define lightweight uh, micromobility, 500 kilograms. And you know, most micromobility vehicles are actually only like 20 kilograms. So why do we do this? Um, Horace says that it's to accommodate the long tail of exceptional demand. First, you take the one mile trips and then you address more jobs to be done. You add weather protection, you add comfort, and soon you're taking the eight mile trips. It's not existential for the automakers now, but it soon will be. And actually, we see this in action. All, everything that Clay said is, has been predicted, and, and we see GM and Ford, our American giants, fleeing up market into SUVs and trucks. They, they see it as pursuing profit, uh, but, but really, they're blind to what's coming. The scooter companies of today are the car makers of tomorrow. And here we see all of the parking in Los Angeles consolidated into an enormous crater. Cars need three to five parking spaces each, yet our idolatry for them gives as much, or gives eight. Sometimes we give as much as 30. And, and this over-serving excess is actually exponential. If I have a bigger car, I actually also have bigger buffer space between the cars, so as not to hit the other cars. I have more space between the parking spaces, so in, when you think of a garage or something like that, and 
our infrastructure is, is more costly. It, it has to withstand the weight that these beastly devices exert. And, and then they erode it quicker as well. And th this excess shapes the entire supply chain too. We are told that connected, autonomous, shared electric vehicles um, are, are, are the cure to this. But what, what they're just going to do too little, too late, and on the time frame of decades. We have to think of a parking space like a bedroom apartment. And in the case of a parking lot, we have to think of that parking space as 100 bedroom apartments because of the skyscraper that's going to be built there. We are giving our world's most expensive real estate to these mechanical boxes that are empty 95% of the time. This is what progressive parking advocate Donald Shoup calls the high cost of free parking. And here we see New York, um, the bike share compared to the taxi to represent the speed at which the car moves through the city. And as you can see, the taxi on the right, um, it, it costs much more per mile. And of course, you'd expect this. But what is unexpected is we see these pedal bikes actually moving faster at, at the very beginning of this movement. And that this is before e-bikes are being introduced into the system, which have been demonstrated to as much as triple ridership, from five rides per day to as much as 15 rides per day. And these e-bikes, these, these wonder devices, they've been also shown to span across age and race and gender. And so in light of the existing and increasing congestion, and you know this better than anyone, you live in Boston, my goodness, um, and pollution and auto loan debt and lack of housing and activism now increasing around climate change and social isolation and disconnection and still billions actually flooding into our cities and on top of this we have 1.3 million viciously taken from us every year without warning this is the leading global cause of death for our young people. And so what is our solution? Is it a better car? We say no, the, the bike predates the car. So why do we need a new term? Micromobility is a new movement. We define it as lightweight electric vehicles. Lightweight is our primary definition. Simple definitions are the most powerful. They're also the most valuable and the ones that will be used by the people. Electric is our secondary definition. This is because micromobility is riding on recent tidal waves of enabling technologies, rapidly falling costs in the smartphone, the battery, the motor, networks, and GPS. And also as a secondary definition, we have utility. This is, are the vehicles being taken to work and to school, or are they toys, like the hoverboard, which crashed and burned, quite literally. And of course, there are many problems going on with this industry. It's a young industry. Every innovation faces these early years of maturation. And much of what you see is, is often actually a study on where the industry was generations ago, or, or it ignores its trajectory, I ignorance of how fast this industry moves. The smartphone went from zero to three billion in 10 years. The car took over a century to get where it is today. And micromobility is the smartphone on wheels. Micromobility growth is as sure to me as companies are incentivized to make profit and governments are incentivized to maximize public benefit. The smaller the creature, the faster it evolves. You think of fruit flies. We do all our tests on them. But 
Think of it also this way. The faster the creature, the slower the industry. You can just ask Boeing how things are doing. And the growth that we're seeing is astounding. This is actually the fastest growing transportation innovation of all time. And Bird was actually the fastest company to a $1 billion valuation of any company ever. And this is because of the insane levels of product market fit that we are so clearly seeing. Joe Krauss, the president of Lime, he came on our podcast and he pointed out that actually many of the world's biggest markets, New York and London, both actually very recently opening up, um, as well as Boston, Philadelphia, Tokyo, and Sydney. He gave us a a step-by-step breakdown that was very conservative, starting from the 300 million trips in the U.S. that he estimates and per day, and taking it all the way down to a 7.5 million vehicles needed to satisfy only 10% um, of, of what is being demanded. And yet, we see for these 7.5 million vehicles that are needed, only say like 300,000, probably less, permits and vehicles. This is all to say that less than, we're seeing a supply of less than 4%. When I first received the case for micromobility from Michael Naka, I, I told my parents, this is a train that is leaving the station that I must be on. And micromobility, it's, it's much more than just replacing car trips. It actually also produces its own demand. Micromobility is about making mobility rewarding and actually joyous. It, it, it allows you to take trips that you wouldn't even have imagined taking. And this expands the market for miles for everybody. It, it grows the pie. Micromobility has only just begun to eat the, the miles, the trips that it rightfully deserves by intrinsic matters of geometry and physics. Micromobility is as sure to me as is the existence of the city, of which there are 1,860 large cities. And this is the case for micromobility. We've been told by companies combined worth trillions that connected autonomous shared electric CASE case is the miracle cure, when in reality, micromobility is here now, and it's going to beat the electric car at its own game. Thank you.